somehow this concept of connectivity is intimately linked to the concept of complexity. And so really what I'm saying is that the universe is getting its act together. It's connecting the dots. It's bringing everything into co-relationship with everything else. And somehow it does this through the production of consciousness. Consciousness is this integrative function in biology which takes data which may appear profoundly unrelated and in fact brings it into some kind of a congruent relationship. We say an organism coordinates a point of view. Well, in a way, what's happening over time is that the universe is coordinating a point of view. And as it does this, it becomes somehow more aware, more self-conscious, more uh, being-like and less thing-like. You could almost say that nature abhors habit, and so it seeks the novel by uh, producing various kinds of phenomena at every level in biology, chemistry, and society. And so there really is a purpose to the universe. Its purpose is this state of hyper-complexification in which all of its points become related to each other, become what mathematicians call cotangent. And uh, it gives the universe the feeling of being imbued with a caring presence. Well, the great watershed difference between the archaic understanding and what is called scientific materialism is the archaic mind understood, in fact perceived, that nature is conscious. Nature is alive. Nature is an organism full of intent. Uh, the goal of the archaic mind is to connect with, communicate with, and align itself to this greater Gaian holism, which is sometimes called nature, the great spirit, the realm of the ancestors. But this is what the archaic uh, mind understood and was comfortable with. And in fact, it is true. Our own uh, decision to view the universe as dead, as inanimate, as unintelligent, allowed us, permitted us to dissect it, use it, and, uh, and uh, deny its validity outside of human purpose. Now the consequences of living like that is coming back to haunt us. You know, we have almost destroyed our home. We have almost cut the earth from beneath our own feet. So this impulse toward the Gylanic and the, and the archaic is uh, a survival instinct at this point. We must give uh, reverence and credence to nature and nature's methods because no other methods will allow us to work our way out of the present mess we're in. Uh, high temperature, high energy resource extraction, commodification, uh, mega agriculture, we're at the end of the rope for these things. So the archaic holds answers, but it only holds answers if we are willing to think of the universe as a living, intelligent entity in with which we are in partnership, not set against, but that in fact we are a part of uh, a morphogenetic intent and an unfolding reality that is larger than human understanding. Imagine, larger than human understanding. <laughs>
not know this and not know, and it kept getting stronger and strong. It never lets you do that, by the way, the not noticing. It's a paradox. You didn't take this to not notice. So uh, eventually he becomes thoroughly alarmed and he tries to call a couple of his friends. Well, it's Saturday night, nobody's home. So then just this tremendous sense of abandonment settles over this guy. His friends aren't there when he needs them. He's going to die here in his apartment and be found days later, so forth and so on. And he gets this ball rolling, see? (laughs) So finally he despairs. He's a psychotherapist, an MD, blah, blah, everything. He despairs. He calls 911. (laughs) So they come, they get him, they rush him to the hospital, um, they put him in a ward, and by the time all this has happened, and he's gotten all this attention, and probably a little second all, uh, he's feeling pretty good about it all. So then he says to the guy on duty, he says... uh, I, I feel like I have to tell you, I, I took psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, do you think that that brought this on? <laughs> and the guy said, uh, no, you had an anxiety attack. We get people with this all the time who don't know anything about psychedelic drugs. <laughs> So, you know, it, it isn't the drug you have to worry about, it's yourself. You have to discipline your hind brain. You have to be able to say, listen, shut up. We're going to come through this. Just shut up about it. Because it's saying, mm, but don't you think we should call somebody? And, but, and, uh, <laughs> um, We shouldn't treat it with such levity because it is a serious issue. I mean, I've been in many circumstances where vital signs seem to have fallen so low in my own perception that I just was saying to myself, keep breathing, keep looking, keep breathing, keep looking. And I felt, you know, that we, I was in a submarine five and a half miles down easy does it through here breath attention breath attention because you have the feeling that if you don't keep your attention on your breath you will simply stop breathing well now it's interesting people who don't worry much about psychedelics you tell them a story like that and they say well isn't that the bit that you take these drugs and you think you're dying and then you get straight and then you don't die and then you're really happy? Isn't that what it's supposed to do? I thought that was what it was about. Well, in fact, if you go back into the literature in the 1960s, the Tibetan Book of the Dead crowd was saying, you will be flung from hell to paradise and back again on about a 40-minute schedule for several hours. And they prepared themselves for these bad trip situations by anticipating it. And I, I don't really think there's that much to it. I think your mind is very fragile in that state. And, you know, a bad thought quickly becomes a cascade. And you have to know how to, dis- how to stop these cascades. A very practical technique that I use is uh, I take a hit of cannabis. Thinking you're going to die, at least for me, is not all that rare. I mean, if somebody invites me to go sailing with them on the bay on a Sunday afternoon, at least twice in the afternoon, I will sign off completely and just assume that's it, you know. Maybe I'm a little paranoid, you know, or maybe I have crazy friends. Mushrooms are my thing. I mean, that they enlightened me, they straightened me out, they love me. Um, but, a, but the way to do mushrooms is the very first move, if you're interested in mushrooms, is for God's sake, 
buy a scale. Buy a scale. I mean, you wouldn't think that this would be considered such an exotic suggestion to people who are going to put their bodies and minds on the line because people don't take enough. People do not take enough mushrooms. They take pissant amounts and then they claim that they're initiates. You must take a measured five dried grams on an empty stomach. Measured. And when you see what that is, you'll realize that, you know, you weren't even camped in the atrium, you were camped in the driveway. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, mushrooms to my, in some ways, I mean, DMT is the most terrifying and astonishing thing in the universe. But it's very hard to know what to do with it. Uh, psilocybin is your friend. It wants to teach. It will take you by the hand and forgive you and lead you and be with you. And uh, it speaks. This is the amazing thing. And you're hearing this from, you know, somebody who graduated from Heidegger and F.H. Bradley. It speaks. No other psychedelic does that, in my experience. Occasionally, a phrase will pop into your head on another substance that is like a gift, an aphorism. But I mean, psilocybin raves. It raves. And it has positions. I mean, you may not like psilocybin as a person because it is not... It, the astonishing thing about the psilocybin entity, to my mind, and I get good confirmation of this, is it is not very earthly. I mean, it wants to show you machines the size of Manhattan in orbit around alien stars. It wants to talk about the sweep through of the da 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 da, -da which happened before the Earth cooled, and it, you know, has seen the empires of the Rull out at the rim and all the rest of it. And it's very puzzling, this cosmic galactarian tone because then you switch over to ayahuasca, which is literally just a twist of the molecule, just the tiniest tweaking of the molecule, and suddenly it's about childbirth, rivers, the land, the feminine, looking inside your body, curing diseases, feeling, telepathy, communication. It could hardly be more different and yet chemically these things are like uh, two sides of the same coin yes first come the dancing mice the little candies the colored grids and so forth and so on but what eventually happens quickly like 10 minutes later is uh, there is an entity in the trance in the vision there is a mind there waiting that speaks good English and invites you up into its room. And what it is is it's a voice in the head that uh, people strove to attain for a thousand years. This was the sine qua non of uh, intellectual accomplishment in the Greco-Roman world. And the Logos told you the right way to live. And this is sort of what you get with psilocybin. You get a voice that can confound you with the depth and brilliance of its answers. This is what you want. And I've had over and over the experience of showing somebody what five grams is, and they're appalled. They say, my God, you can't be serious. I mean, I, I take a, a fifth that much, a fourth that much. Yeah, well, that's the problem. That's why you don't have elves in the attic and bats in the belfry like I do. A lot of people uh, have said you're a hallucination nut. You're obsessed with hallucination. I freely admit it. Uh, but I will defend my obsession with vision. I think the world wants to be seen. I think 
Blake was right, that the divine imagination is something beheld. And for me, the visions are the proof that this is not my mind. And the visions are the proof that this is not simply chemical chaos in the nervous system. And when we communicate with each other and understand each other, we instinctively reach for visual metaphors. I see what you mean. Look here, fella. Uh, she painted a picture. Uh, his words were so beautiful. It means that we really associate meaning with seeing something. There is something about us that causes us to addict to everything. We addict to territory, and then we'll kill to defend it. We addict to each other. If any of you have ever been unexpectedly left by a sexual partner, the symptoms of that are exactly like the symptoms of withdrawal from heroin. I mean, you burst into tears unexpectedly, you vomit every few hours, you hide in darkened rooms, you can't face people, you don't want to go anywhere, you, you are withdrawing. And it's exactly the same thing. We addict to each other, then we, we addict to all forms of behavior, to routine. You know, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, the founder of general systems theory, said human beings are not machines, but in every case where they are given the opportunity to behave like machines, they will choose to do so. So th this, and this is why we need uh, an external input to dissolve our programming. We apparently evolved with this need. And uh, in societies where psychedelics are not available, poor substitutes have, have been put in place. Starvation, flagellation, sonic driving, um, oh, I don't know, uh, complicated visualizations and so forth. These are stopgap measures to try to assuage and direct uh, this, uh, this virulent need of ours to addict to something. Well, when you take the tendency to addict to behaviors and cultural modes and so forth and weld it to the demonic capacity of modern technology to produce more powerful drugs than have ever been known before and in greater amounts so that laboratories can produce literally tens of millions of doses of cocaine or heroin can pr be produced in rural laboratories in Burma or Colombia. And then you have a global transportation and delivery system that within 24 hours can have this stuff on the street in Frankfurt, Bangkok, Tokyo. Uh, it means that we have to take hold of ourselves and realize what is going on. The dark side of ourselves, married to technology, can just carry us to hell in a handbasket without any difficulty at all if we don't uh, quickly and radically uh, revise our relationship to these things. So um, the, the issue, strangely enough, which lies directly ahead of us on the historical continuum is in fact the issue of drugs and more broadly the issue of addiction. What we are doing to ourselves. Unexamined habitual behavior patterns. And after all, isn't that what we object to about hard drugs? Isn't that what is so offensive about the anything addict? The heroin addict, the television addict, the thing addict, is that when it comes time for their fix, whether it be saint elsewhere or whatever, do not stand in these people's way. You know, they are going for the button, they are going for the syringe, whatever it is. Imagine for a moment 
that anything was possible. Imagine, for example, that the laws of physics were suddenly replaced with the laws of the imagination. Well, that's a very interesting meditation because it starts out, at least for me, I think, well, if I could have anything, what would I have? Well, what would I like to have if I could have anything? So it begins modestly. I would somehow transfer the Vatican Library to Versailles, and I would live at Versailles, uh, and uh, have access to the Vatican Library, and all other books and works of art that have ever existed, and I would walk in a garden. But then I start thinking like this, and I say, no, but the, the, the question was, what would it be like if it could be anything? Why would you want Versailles? Why would you want the Vatican Library? You, if you could have anything. And you realize our imagination is completely constrained by the laws of physics. What would we become if we could become anything? I mean, if I could snap my fingers and you were omnipotent, what would you do? The first thing I would do is I would fly. I would just leap about 300,000 feet in the air and give the cowboy yell. But then you would realize, you know, the entire universe is now your model. You can cross the galaxy in the wink of an eye. You can journey back to the Big Bang in the time it takes to think about it. There is no civilization in the history of the cosmos, no work of art, no ecstasy, no experience that is denied you. And I maintain that we would become, within minutes of this transformation, unrecognizable to ourselves because we are completely defined by our limitations. And, and so that's what I imagine death is. It's the discovery that you can be, do, see, think, and feel anything. When was the last time that you were actually sick with amazement? You know, uh, when was the last time you were actually white with sheer terror? Probably, unless you've been caught in automobile accidents or landslides, it was a psychedelic experience. Because these things deliver authentic emotion, authentic data, and the, the the bum bit of history is that it depotentiates uh, human individuals. Just in order to live inside a historical society, you have to sculpt yourself down and down and down. You mustn't be in other people's face. You mustn't thrust your ethnicity or your gender or your tattoo or whatever it is to uh, in, 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 you mustn't flaunt, everything is confined. This is the attitude of history. It's what's called being part of the public. It's something necessary for democracies to do business. There has to be a public. But when we identify with the public, we essentially become creatures of the herd. And there is no peace until the end. There is no let up in pressure until the end. As we approach the transcendental object at the end of time, history moves faster and faster. Uh, we have been approaching this transcendental object since before there was a we to speak of in human terms. In other words, this is the same attractor that pulled life out of the oceans, caused primates to stand on their hind legs, and so forth and so on. But obviously, pick a number, about 20,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, the process quickened. We turned the corner. Everything began to move faster. And again, at the fall of Rome, faster, faster. 
and again in the 20th century, faster, faster, faster. Well, nobody has drawn the obvious conclusion from this. If we're going faster and faster, faster and faster, then hell, we're gonna get somewhere pretty soon. <laughs> And that's where I think we are. We can hardly go any faster without the speed of our acceleration passing into the domains of humanly cognizable time. In other words, the reason things are getting weirder and weirder is because the space-time continuum itself is accelerating. It's entirely possible that the last half of the life of the universe will happen in about 3% of the total life of the universe. Nobody said that it has to take as long going down as it took to come up. It may be that the coming up took a long, long time and the going down can be catastrophic, sudden, unexpected, dynamic, we say. And that's why I take, and I return to this theme, because, hey, I return to all things, that history is an anticipation. History is the last call that the train is leaving the station. You know, and the call echoes back to Chatal Hyuyuk and slightly beyond. But in our own lifetime, it's now palpable. You know, all you have to do is close your eyes in a quiet place, twist up a bomber, think, and you will behold the transcendental object at the end of time. You can feel it informing your own life. I mean, you spend a good deal of time denying it because rationalists tell you you're either losing your mind or it's impossible and it can't be happening. But this sense of plottedness of connectedness, this sense that we are all in a universal drama playing to a close, this sense that we are larger than ourselves, that we are somehow characters on a stage. This is a phenomenon of the light at eventide. This is a phenomenon of the final moments of the cosmic drama. And uh, I think it's tremendously exciting. I think this is what nature set about 700 million years ago on this planet. That it's not about chipmunk after chipmunk after chipmunk for eon after eon after eon. I mean, a little of that goes a long way, as I'm sure you'll agree with me. That's all very fine, but the way nature works is she builds upon her complexity. We can feel that we're more than animal. We have this dimension which we call spiritual, which, and some of us buy into some off-the-shelf explanation. Catholicism, Mormonism, Jainism, something like that. Others of us wrestle with it or we smorgasbord it into, you know, a little kapala, a little Taoism, a little Tantra, a little Hasidism, it doesn't matter, you know, do that. But whatever it is, we wrestle with this part of ourselves which cannot be simply dismissed as monkey meat. And I think that it is the soul that the soul is actually a, an entity in history seeking to be born and that the enterprise of history is the creation of the collectivity as an eternal, indestructible, trans-dimensional object of some sort, the tool at the end of time. I've told the story about uh, how in the Amazon, when all this stuff was breaking loose, I went through this period where very calmly and deeply and without having any need to tell anyone, I thought, I came to the opinion that I was like 
enlightened. And it was this very low-key thing. It was all about appropriate behavior. This was the cognitive hallucination that I was having. It was about appropriate behavior. And I had this idea there's an appropriate way to do everything. And if you do it the appropriate way, no energy will be lost. And so you become like super conducting. You become like some kind of super Tai Chi character where you just do things so niftily that there's no problem, whether it's plucking a flower or moving a boulder. And I was told, when you think, sit on the ground. This was, there were all these teachings and they were very simple. They were things like, sit on the ground, stupid. And, uh, you know, Use your fingers. That was a big teaching. Use your fingers. <laughs> so one of the things I was into was how you wash the pot. We had one pot. It was this little enamel pot. And we would bake it over a fire and we baked beans and we baked rice and all these terrible things that would get scum on the bottom. And so it was a big deal about drawing lots for who washed the pot. Well, I discovered in my enlightened state that we had been doing it all wrong. And that if you would go down to the water with the pot and, and take sand and pat it very, very lightly in the bottom and then say, please, that then all you had to do was pour water into the pot and swish it around and empty it like that, and then when you looked in, it would be like Drano, you know, it would just be blinding white. <laughs> and I did this several times, and I thought, how appropriate a miracle this is. This is a real miracle. I mean, this is just simple stuff. It's totally here and now. It's absolutely Taoist. It's completely, you know, on and on. Uh, so then I had a critic in our crowd, and so I thought that I would enlighten the critic by a wordless demonstration of my obvious command of the howling Tao. So I invited the critic to in accompany me to the river, and, uh, and I said, and now notice that I pick up the sand, I pat it into the bottom. I'm not agitating it. I look into the sky and I say, please. And then I put water in it and I swish it around. Voila! I said, is something supposed to happen? <laughs> and I look and the crud adheres. And then this person says, you know, I pity you. <laughs> And I would pity you more, but you alarm me. <laughs> it is upon us. Every messiah, every religious ontology, every... Uh, manager of every booth that this exhibit is reflecting a distorted scintilla of the spiritual reality of the transcendental object at the end of time. Every one of us is a particularized and distorted image of this transcendental object into which we are being dissolved, into which global culture is being uh, dissolve. So, uh, <laughs> well, so what? <laughs> <laughs> so we can cut into this cycle at any point. We can become aware of it. We can become part of it. We can deny it. There is no loss in the circuit. There is no blame. Becoming, then, what psychedelic means is it means claiming this dimension as your own. You know, Plato said time is the moving image of eternity. 
That moving image of eternity can be beheld in the silent darkness of the mind on five grams of psilocybin. And if you, if you think the universe is mundane, if you think there are no more frontiers to cross, no more adventures to be had, I'm telling you, you can turn your living room into the bridge of Magellan's ship on a long Saturday evening with five grams of psilocybin in silent darkness. We are living in the most empowering age in human history because all of the energy of the ancestors, not only the human ancestors, but our animal, our primate ancestors, all of that energy pours into, is focused into this moment. We are the transition generation. We have one foot in matter and one foot in hyperspace. And we can redeem the trust of thousands of years. All of the horror of history can be redeemed if we don't drop the ball. Every pogrom, every instance of racial, sexual, or minority persecution can be redeemed if we give the human adventure meaning. And we give it meaning by discovering the totality within ourselves and then exemplifying it for each other. And this dissolves boundaries, empowers the weak, uh, enlightens the strong, and brings hope to all. And it can only be done if we accept the gifts which nature has offered us. Thank you very, very much. The last thought I want to leave you with, which is a sort of a coincidentia positorum thought, because it will bum some and exalt others, is the one thing that I've learned from psychedelics that seems secure over all the decades and the, you know, embracing one idea, one ideology after another, the one thing that seems secure is a, a truth that is hard to hear in the context of a dominator culture with an obsession with the material world. And, and that truth is that nothing lasts. Nothing <laughs> lasts. You know, your enemies will fade, your friends will fade, your fortune, your poverty, your disappointments, your dreams, everything is in the process of changing into something else. So your agony is about to be assuaged. On the other hand, your happiness is about to be destroyed. So the, the obligation that comes out of this realization is an obligation to the, the immediate moment, to this thing that I've been calling the felt moment of immediate experience. It isn't who you were or what you were or who you will be or what you will be. It's the felt moment of immediate experience and this has been robbed from us by media and by our tendency to denigrate ourselves to see the world in terms of the great ones not here whoever they are aristotle madonna jesus whatever your particular bent is uh, the overcoming of neurosis of unhappiness of toxic lifestyles is uh the felt presence of immediate experience in the body in the moment and you know psychedelics sexuality gastronomy sport dance these are the things which put you in the felt presence of the moment and that's really all you ever possess your memories are eroding away the futures you anticipate will mostly not come to pass and the real uh, richness is in the moment and it's not necessarily some kind of be here now feel good thing because it doesn't always feel good but it always feels it is a domain of feeling it's primary language is not primary ideology 
is not primary. The propagation of future and past vectors is not primary. What's primary is the felt presence of experience, and that is the source of love, and that is the source of community. If, so I'm, if someone had never taken psychedelics and had no interest in it, and had come here because they thought this was the Traegering group, I think they would be truly alarmed and disturbed by what they hear, because we appear to be mad people, because we appear to be fully engaged with an unseen, invisible world, and we're calling it the cause of history, the purpose for the future, and the basis for everything going on between us. But uh, nobody said life was simple because every single person uh, who does this is seeing things no human eye has ever fallen upon. And uh, it is a realm of ideas and we do each bring back different souvenirs from that place. We are all equally qualified. We don't know who will spot the whale, but everyone should have their eye peeled because that's what we're doing. We're searching for an encounter with Leviathan. Nature is God. That was the informing vision of Moby Dick, and uh, it's a good one to carry as a metaphor into, this, into the psychedelic experience. There again was a perfect example of the male ego unable to release into the matrix of nature until it literally dragged them into the depths. Through the building of community, through the music and the dissolution of boundaries, through the use of these psychedelics, the shaman are showing how you create an archaic style culture after 5,000 years of human history. Because we can't abandon technology. We have six billion people on this uh, planet. But the shaman and the rave culture are showing us how we can take what was best in the society of 25,000 years ago and bring it into the center of our lives and live it again and create a community of caring, intelligent people who've got their heart connected to their head and their heart connected to their feet so that through dance, feeling, philosophy, sexuality, art, uh, we manifest the creativity that is going to be necessary for us to save ourselves. This is the key, you see. If the expansion of consciousness does not play a major role in the human future, what kind of future is it going to be? My goals are very modest. I'm very pleased that it chose to confide so concrete an idea in me. But if it had never chosen to do that, I still would die a happy man with the unspeakable experiences of beauty that it has shared with me. Because my psychedelic trips these days are not about the time wave. The time wave is pretty much a, a done a done deal. So I think it's like everything else in life. Intent is everything and impeccability means in that domain do not seek to use. Do not seek to use. It's a religious mystery and that doesn't mean it's an unsolved problem. It means a mystery and uh, life is only worth living as long as the mysteries continue to inform, transform, and inspire us. And the, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll leave you, is the truth can take care of itself. You don't have to approach the truth with eyes lowered and gaze averted on bended knee. That's how you approach bullshit. But the truth is so powerful that you can kick the tires, turn over the engine, check the odometer, and nobody is offended. Truth is real. It can stand the test. And that's why, you know, I went all over the world looking at various spiritual traditions. 
I don't feel it's putting them down to say that they were ineffective because they were all great aspirations. But the only real open doorway that I ever found uh, were the plans. This works. You know, in other spiritual disciplines, everybody wants to go faster. They want the Roshi to give them further empowerments. They want further uh, information, postures, secret teachings, so forth and so on. Once you reach the psychedelic experience, the accelerator is far less interesting than the location of the brakes. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. We're not trying to push. We all know how to push this so fast, we can't stand it. personal act of courage made by the individual, an act of courage which involves surrender. Surrender is the opposite side of the coin of ego. The central issue of our times is our inability to surrender to what we know is right. We have the ability to feed the hungry. We have the ability to educate our children, to clean up our environment, to eliminate sexism, to eliminate racism. The question is, can we change our minds fast enough? Not can we change our minds, but can we change them fast enough? A return to archaism with the lessons learned in history. That's where we were happy. The fall was a fall into a veil of tears, into a world of uh, limitation and pain and suffering and infectious disease and so forth and so on. It's a prodigal journey into a lower dimension that can now be ended by a collective cultural decision to commit to this Taoist, shamanistic, feminized, cybernetic, caring, aware, present kind of being. I mean, it's nothing more than what each of us is in our very best moments. But we have to extend those very best moments to fill whole lifetimes. That's interesting. The age thing. That's great. Old man, Old man McKinney. It must be approaching 2012 now. He's... <laughs> this is <laughs>